Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, evening's assessment in, M in the MYP uh, information webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us on time. And if you could just bear with us for about another minute, we'll just let everyone join on and get comfortable. And then we will start soon after that. So thanks for being on time and just give us a minute or so to let everyone come on. All right, Rebecca, we have uh, 36 people on the call right now, so okay. you can start your presentation. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank, thank you for joining me this evening. The meeting is being recorded, and we will share a, a, a copy of that recording. Um, so most, most of you know who I am. I've been at Jess for 16 years. I have um, been in Singapore for 20 years, and I've held various posts at Jess. And I'm currently the middle years program coordinator. I also um, I am part of what we call the IB Educators Network. Um, that's a, um, a network of teachers, um, and we 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 do various training and school visits for the IB. So I'm involved in in inspection and evaluation of NYP schools across the region, and also in training. Um, other um, NYP teachers and NYP coordinators um, in the um, IB NYP program. And I also do a lot of training for the DP as well. So um, that's my background. That's where I'm coming from. Um, I've been um, involved with the NYP for 16 years and for the diploma for 20 years. So very um, a long background of working knowledge with the, the NYP. I'm happy to be at the helm of it again at Jess. So that's just a little background on me. So you, you know where I'm coming from for this evening. Um, our agenda this evening is really, I wanted to, to set up this evening because there's often questions around IB assessment and how does MYP assessment work? What does criterion related mean? What are we doing in the classroom? How do we decide what do we assess? So I wanted to, to cover that. I want to talk to you a little bit about how as a teacher, we would, uh, IB teacher, um, we look at using the NYP best fit approach. Um, and I wanted to look at report cards and how as a parent, how we feel that, you know, you might want to look at that and explore that with your, your child and help them to set their goals. Um, and what I will do is I will, I have the question and answer panel up. So I will monitor that as we go through. I will give space at the end. I plan to answer questions about assessment at the end. If you have any, <coughs> apologies, I, but I will monitor the questions. So if there are any questions you have at any point, I'll have a look. And if I think I'm gonna cover it just a few slides later, I probably won't address it straight away. But if I think it's something that's really relevant to that slide, and it's worth discussing with everybody, I'll address it, I'll address it right away. So do feel free to pop questions in on the, the question um, panel. So if you hover your icon for me, if I hover my cursor towards the top of the screen, I can get the where I can ask a question. I, but some, for some people, it comes up at the bottom of the screen with the cursor. Okay, so I wanted to start with just going through the two assessment types that are used in schools and in education in general. And that's formative assessment and summative assessment. Um, so formative assessment is something that informs. So a formative assessment will inform the student, will inform um, the teacher how the learning is going at that time. And formative assessment can be really straightforward. So for example, I might do a quick one to 10 quiz with my class. That would be formative assessment. I asked my class today, do you have any questions from the homework? There were two fantastic questions. We talked about that. That informs me what gaps they have with their learning. So formative assessment 
is really about drafting, it's about practice, it's about rehearsing skills. Um, it's, it's used to develop and it's used by teachers to develop our understanding of what do the students understand, what don't they understand, what should we revise, what help sheets should I make, how could I change this unit next time. So it informs me. For the students, it gives them a chance to see, well, where am I at now before I have the big final summative assessment that's going to appear on my report card? So it's really ongoing, it's continuous. It could be a, a first draft so that the students have to um, maybe do an oral exam. So they get a practice oral exam or they um, get to hand in their poster, get some feedback, and then they get to resubmit it for final assessment. Um, or it could be as simple as, as I said, a quick, a quick um, check-in, a quick quiz, it could be, um, I often get my students to, I give them a list of what we need to learn if it's a test coming up and they might highlight those, those items in red, um, green and orange, like a traffic light system. What do they need to revise? What's a quick review? And what don't they need to revise? Because they've got it, they've got it, they understand it. So there's lots of ways in which we do formative assessment. And in fact, an entire lesson is always formative assessment because you're constantly, you're monitoring, you're seeing, you're, you're listening, you're, you're answering questions as a teacher and you're constantly being informed about how students are learning. And then we have those more official formative assessments. So for grade 10, the personal project, the students have had formative opportunities to hand in first drafts. And because that's a little bit, it's a bit bigger it's a it's a bit more um uh teachers providing feedback then we would put that as a formative assessment on the assessment calendar so we make a, a note of it i wouldn't make a note on the assessment calendar of every time i i ask my students have you got any questions even though that is a type of formative assessment okay summative assessment are those big pieces of assessment. So they are your official pieces of assessment. Let me see if I can just move this. Um, so um, for summative assessments, we have to, as an IB school, use the IB prescribed criteria. Um, a summative assessment would be a student's opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge or their understanding or their skills or a combination of those based on a period of work, which we call a unit, a unit of study. Um, we normally place summative assessments towards the end of a period of learning because you want the students to have the chance to, 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 to understand the content, take some action, do some activities, inquire, collaborate, do lots of formative, and then come to the point where you're getting them to do that final summative assessment which, you, which we as teachers are grading and then reporting. So you want to give the students that period of time to learn. And that's why you see the summative assessments tend to come towards the end of the unit, or sometimes you might get two stage summative assessments. So there might be two summative assessments in a unit. And one might happen slightly earlier than the other. Okay, so um, the other thing is the summative assessment is the assessment we have to report. So it's the assessment that you're going to, the grades you're going to see in the grade book and the grades you're going to see on the report cards are informed by summative assessment. So we see it as a final piece of work, a final demonstration of learning. And that takes different forms in different education systems. Um, uh, for our diploma students, that big summative assessment, the official one, of course, comes for those May exams in grade 12, but they will have summative assessments placed by their teachers as they go through as well. Okay, so NYP. Um, so the IB publishes assessment criteria for our eight subject groups. So what you're seeing here on this image is the, the IB Middle Years program um, icon and it shows the eight subject groups. So in some subject groups, we have multiple subjects. So for example, in our sciences, our grade nines and tens, they study biology, chemistry, and physics, but it comes under the heading sciences. Um, language, um, um, 
and literature, we've got English, we've got German, we've got Dutch, we've got Danish, some of our students do Swedish, some of our students do mother tongue. So, but they would all follow the same um, subject group um, criteria. Okay, so in the NYP, students will study from these eight subject groups from grade six through to grade 10. And we use the published assessment criteria to assess the student's summative learning in each of those subjects. Um, we have four criteria for each subject. So um, in each subject group, um, A to D. So we call them criteria A, criteria B, C, D. And so you're, you will hear your children coming home and saying, I've got a criterion A assessment. Um, sometimes we can conduct a summative assessment where we can group them. So we can assess a student on um, several criteria at once. So for example, my own subject science, we often do an experiment and the students will write the lab report and we can grade the lab report against criterion B and C. So it's one piece of work, but more than one criteria is assessed. Okay. The IB um, require their schools to develop NYP units of study. And um, typically, a typical unit in our NYP would be eight to 11 weeks of learning. And you would have to have a summative assessment um, to assess the students on that period of learning, what we call a unit. Um, I think uh, it's important to note here, there's two core elements of the NYP, which I'm not gonna focus in on, especially this evening. One is the personal project, which is done in grade 10. And the other is an interdisciplinary unit, a unit of work that involves uh, two or more subjects coming together. They, um, both personal project and interdisciplinary units have their own assessment criteria, again, published by the IB, that we have to use. Um, and those are only out of three criteria. So A, B, C, those two um, are the two exceptions, but all of the subjects have these four A, B, C, D assessment criteria. Okay, so, um, what, what, what's the difference between an objective and a criterion? And I wanted to share this. So the IB give us as a school subject guide. So each subject group, each teacher gets a subject guide. The IB also run professional development whenever they release a new subject guide, which is typically every eight years. So the IB runs through a cycle of um, updating their subject guides. Um, and in the subject guide, it has clear objectives for the subject. What do we want students to learn for this subject area? Who decides that? Well, it's a panel of teachers from around the world that the IB select, normally very experienced teachers, normally teachers that are involved in training and involved in um, uh, part of the examination or moderation process. Um, and they pool a team of teachers, typically a, a group of around eight teachers from around the globe that will come together and bring their subject expertise and they will develop objectives for learning in their subject group. Okay, and they, so they develop these objectives. So the objectives translate to the criteria. So for each of the subjects, there are four sets of objectives, A, B, C, D. What should you learn through learning that subject? And then the criterion are assessing, have the students learned that? Have they developed those skills? Have they met those objectives for learning? So um, criterion A is taken from the objectives A, criterion B is taken from objectives B, C from C and D from D. So it directly translates. And you can see on the screen um, that, um, for example, um, most subjects, you've got criterion A is about knowledge and understanding. And so 
you're going to see um, that objective focusing on students' ability to demonstrate understanding and to use terminology effectively and to solve problems. And so this translates into what looks on the screen like bullet points. We call them strands, the IB call them strands. So your child is assessed typically on two to three strands per criterion. So three things that they have to be able to do. And I wanted to show you some of those this evening so I could kind of um, get you to understand when you're, when you're, if your child's saying, uh, talking about criterion, they're talking about strands, where did these come from? They come from this, this um, cycle of, of review where the IB set objectives for learning those subjects. So, I want to take you through some of those, um, some exemplars of, of what we do when we assess and how we assess, but it's really important to first of all, talk about the, the difference between um, MYP assessment and what you might see in a typical system for this age group. So typically schools in um, for grades uh, six, seven, eight, you often see rubrics and uh, checklists um, for students doing assessment very similar to what you see in the NYP. But a typical system when you're looking at certainly grades nine and grade 10 would be a more traditional exam-based system. Students go through a period of learning and then they demonstrate that knowledge, understanding and skill in an exam setting under a time duration and under exam conditions. And what happens is what we call norm distribution. So, um, if I look at a uh, system I grew up with, which was GCSEs, a uh, system I used to teach, IGCSEs, um, what will happen is um, all the students that are taking that, that exam across the globe, their data is gathered and it's plotted along, uh, their scores are gathered and plotted against a bell curve. And then on that bell curve, only um, your top 20% can get the highest grade and the, the bottom 10% are getting the lowest grade, and then in the, you get those students grouped in the middle. So the data informs where the bell curve sits. And so the students are compared with their peers, the other people taking that exam. So if you are in a particularly strong cohort, that will affect potentially where you sit on that bell curve because there's only a certain proportion can ever get that highest score. So this is norm distribution, and it's very, very common in exam-based systems. Um, so the IB moved beyond that. We do not do a norm distribution for the MYP. So they have criterion-related descriptors, and we do criterion-related assessment. What does that mean? Instead of marking every child in the group, placing them on a bell curve, and then um, giving them a score based on how they did compared to their peers, which is the norm system, in the NYP system, students are given a rubric. The rubric states what they have to do um, and what the learning would look like at at levels from one to eight. A level zero would mean that that student did not submit the work or that they submitted a work that didn't actually respond to any of the descriptions. Students are introduced to the um, criteria descriptors prior to the task. So that can be, um, uh, done in a variety of ways, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So students have an opportunity to see this set of descriptors um, in advance of submitting the task, participating in the task. The student then has the opportunity, every student has the opportunity to demonstrate their learning, and we don't compare them against each other on a bell curve. So um, every student has the potential to get in the highest bands seven and eight. The student's work is then graded and referenced against the descriptors and the teacher then makes a judgment about how the work relates to the description. 
And so what you see is a scaffolding of levels. So a one to two is a less sophisticated piece of work, um, uh, more simple statements, more factual content. Whereas seven to eight, you're looking at more unfamiliar settings, unfamiliar problems, more explanation, more detail, um, students showing a sense of validity, judgment, explanation, examples um, in their work. But that's what criterion related means. Um, criterion referenced is another system, but a criterion reference system means a child must do everything correct in level one and two before they can possibly be graded three and four. And again, criterion related doesn't mean that. A student might not do everything in level one and two, but they might do everything in level three and four and be graded within level three and four, uh, even if they had a gap in some of those earlier task requirements. So criterion related really means we're trying to find the description that best relates to the child's work. Okay, I'm just gonna check. I don't think there's any cues, questions yet. So um, MYP, so the MYP, as I said, publishes four criteria per subject group. And what they have is um, they, have they have three variations for each criterion. So they have what they call NYP year one, NYP year two, th three, NYP year four, five. And we see subtle jumps. So I've given you an example on the screen, which is taken from the NYP science guide. This is criterion D. Criterion D gets students to link the learning from the course content to the real world. How are we using science to solve problems in the real world? So you can see the IB published three variations of Criterion D assessment description. If we look at the grade six, it's asking them to list examples, state ways. So it's, um, what we're demanding of them then increases. So grade seven and eight, or the NYP year three criterion, asks them to describe the way in which science is used. So instead of listing examples, they've now got to use more descriptive language. And in grade nine and 10, they have to not only describe how the science works, but explain its implications, explain how it's applied and used. So you're, you're looking at um, this sort of development in terms of what's expected. So it's quite natural when a student moves from a grade six to a grade seven, they've got to, their assessment tasks are gonna be a little bit more challenging because they've suddenly got, their writing's got to be more descriptive if we look at this for an example. And when a student moves from grade eight to grade nine, you've got that jump again. So sometimes those transition points, you, you might see a child that, that they don't do as well at the beginning of grade seven as they did at the end of grade six. That's because we're expecting more from them. And, and it's designed this way because, especially during adolescence, students, the way they think will shift from the concrete and the absolute to the more abstract. Uh, things are less black and white. Students can, can um, give more examples. They can see two different perspectives a lot more easily and understand that as they go through adolescence. And so we, there is this more challenge brought in from the IB. I've put another example on the next slide. This is from PE. So MYP year one, this is what it looks like in the teacher, the, the subject guide that we receive as teachers. Um, so in year one, um, we use with grade six, NYP year three, we use with grades seven and eight, and NYP year five, we use with grades nine and 10. And so we see this, this jump in expectations. And what I've highlighted in yellow is just to show you where we see a little bit of change. So you can see, this is, um, this is PE, this is their criterion A. So this is um, a link to their objective A. And it's about their knowledge and understanding of physical and health education. And you can see there's three things that students have to do under this under criterion A for PE. 
And if we look at that first strand, which is I, um, you can see in grade six, they're outlining um, physical and health education um, knowledge. In grades seven and eight, they have to describe it. And in grades nine and 10, they have to explain it. So one of the jobs we have as teachers is just trying to support students to understand that we're looking at, we're looking for more descriptive, detailed storytelling in their writing um, as they progress through the NYP. Okay. Not necessarily always writing, it's also performance. We're looking for an increase in what they can do with their performance or maybe an oral exam. Um, but you're looking at them practicing more challenging cognitive skills as they get older. So they have to be able to do that a little bit more as they get older and their brain is more ready for that. So, oops, okay. So I wanted to, to kind of move on to how do, we, how do we then grade as a teacher? So what I've put on here is an example of a rubric um, from the personal project, which is what grade 10 have to do. And this is the criterion A rubric. So this is what we have as teachers to mark the personal project criterion A. What I've put in writing on here is the IB instructions for grading, if you like. I've just, I've kind of tried to share that straight from the book. So um, when you're doing criterion related grading, you look at the student's work. So you're reading the student's piece of work or you're watching their performance or you're listening to their oral presentation. Um, and then you're cross-referencing that against this, um, this grading grid. So I'm looking at the student work and I'm thinking, have they stated a learning goal? Yes. Have they given me connections? Yes. And I'm, I'm looking at strand one and I'm seeing, I start with level one and two. Have they done that? Yes. Then I'm looking at three and four. Okay. So often a student, you can, you can, as a teacher, you're very used to using the rubric and you can see the piece of work and you know, you're going straight in at five and six, and then you're looking to seven and eight. Have they, have they come into that? How do we decide between a three and a four? Um, if the student is really consistently um, meeting it, um, meeting that description, matching that description, we would award the higher level within that band. So if I, if I can see this student piece of work is between a three and a four, and I can see that they're very consistently um, meet, matching that description, then I'm gonna give them a four. If there are a few gaps, a few limitations, I'm going to go with the three, okay? If they meet everything in the level three and four, if their work ex exceeds what's there, uh, I would then start looking at the descriptions in the five to six box, could I give them a five to six? If they meet everything in the five to six box, I'm gonna look in the seven to eight box. So as I said before, we're not comparing one student with another. So there's no norm distribution here. We're looking at the student's work compared to the descriptors. I always say to students in class, when, we're, when we're, we're giving the rubrics in class, we often share them, so they're shared on via the management calendar or they're shared through the OneNote or in the Teams or in paper. We often get the students to look at the seven to eight. What are you looking at doing when you want to get seven and eight? Take a few minutes, read that, any questions? So, um, because we want to draw their attention to what are you trying to aim for to get those highest achievement levels. Okay. Like all things, I think it's really important to talk about limitations. And I would say sometimes that's a lot of information. If we look at that, that grid on the previous page, that can be a lot of information. So a student, especially a student that's new to the NYP or has come from another system um, and, and um, they, have to, they have to get used to the fact that probably if you're going to cut down your reading time, you wanna look at that seven to eight box, look at that, what, what is the maximum you need to do? Um, what level of detail are we asking from you? 
what are you going to be facing in that test or, or what you're going to be putting on that post or during your performance. Um, Sometimes too much information can be a little bit overwhelming. So though we try and get the students to, to, to look and to look at the seven to eight, look at what, what, what we're working towards, um, sometimes that sheet can just, that seems like a lot of information and the student will, the student might want to, to um, uh, find it a little bit too much sometimes too much information so I would say that for rubrics and that's where that's where we always try and narrow it down a little bit by telling them just to look at that seven to eight box or to focus on just what are the three strands really aiming at um, just to try and make that a little bit more simplified for them we're providing checklists often we provide writing scaff scaffolds so if we we know what the rubrics asking them to do so we would say in paragraph one you're talking about this in paragraph two you're talking about that so that's what happens in the classroom when we try and unpack the, the assessment tasks with the students the ib although we mark using the ib descriptions um, we are allowed to give students task specific clarifications to focus what they're doing so putting it in the context of the topics so if the topic um, is about um, the periodic table in chemistry, then we might reword some of that um, to include, you are explaining who invented the periodic table. You will state some of the, the features of the periodic table. You will um, give an example of an early periodic table. So we would put it into the context. These are called task specific clarifications where we, we make we make it a little bit more focused for the, the students so that they can see um, what they're going to do in terms of that unit, what they have to do. So again, we might present that in a grid um, with the achievement levels. So I wanted to use, I've used this, we've used this example for a long time. We used to, when we could have a live audience, get some of the parents, we give, give you different instructions about what you needed to do um, um, to clap and we used to get everybody clapping but as we're all online I'm going to fall back on this example which is how to make a sandwich so just to show you uh, again what we mean by increasing levels of sophistication so for example for a level one and two we might be looking for a student to state how to make a sandwich and list the fillings that could go inside a sandwich if we were doing home ec okay and then to get a three and four, we'd want the student to describe how to make a sandwich. So a little bit more detailed, um, a bit more descriptive language. Um, we want them to explain possible combinations to show us that they understand that some things just don't go well together. And then we want them to demonstrate. So they have to create a sandwich if they want to achieve in that level. So increasing levels of sophistication. So then I, as a teacher, I go and mark, sorry, it skipped ahead. Um, I would then go and mark their, their work. So they've, they've made a sandwich, I'm looking at it, they've, they've written about making a sandwich and I'm looking at their work. And I start with that achievement level one and two. Have they stated how to make a sandwich? Yes. Have they listed some fillings? Yes. Have they created a sandwich? Yes. But, I, you can see here, I've given ticks where I think they have achieved it, but I don't feel that they described how to make a sandwich. It was very factual. It didn't use descriptive language. I don't have any details. Um, they haven't explained combinations of fillings. They've just given me a bullet point list of fillings. Then I'm not going to feel that they've achieved those descriptions. Their work doesn't match those descriptions. So... I know they've achieved level one and two, they've done those two things and they've created a sandwich. So I'm awarding this child a three. Um, they have, they've, they've got some work that's in that level three, four box, but they haven't completely done everything that's in that level three, four box. So I'm going to award a three rather than a four, but it's definitely more than a two because they've done they have created a sandwich, they've, they've moved up a level, they've, they've added something. So 
that's that's how it works. This idea that we we uh, look at the descriptions, we look at the child's um, uh, performance work, and and we use our professional judgment to see which descriptions their work aligns with. And I want I will come back to that a little bit in terms of how can we help students kind of progress and, and improve, which is a common question. You know, parents parents want to support and they want to help. And we all know teenagers aren't always that 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 communicative um, as they as they grow older, which is a natural part of adolescence. And so I want to, to go through some of the things I think we could do. So now I'm going to talk about the best fit method, which is the method we use to assign grades on the report card. Um, and that's where we look at when we've got more than one data point. So as we go through the academic year, a student might have taken a criterion A three times and they have got three different grades for criterion A. And I'm the teacher and I'm going to write my report card at the end of the year and I'm going to put a grade on that report card. I have to apply best fit. So what I need to do is I need to have the descriptors to cr for criterion A by my side, and I need to think about um, which description best aligns with the, the student's current um, progress and development and achievement. So I can see here, if I look at this gray book, I've, they've got a two and then a three and then a three, and I'm like, okay, that two was very early on and clearly as we've progressed throughout the year they've now get they've now they've had two threes consistently so that's obviously where they're at as we progress through the year we've seen a progression in their grade so I'm going to say best fit three sometimes a student might join late might be absent might miss an assessment um, and we only have one grade for that criterion and that's then the grade that's reported on the report card. Sometimes a student has shown a sequence of work, but we can, um, best fit doesn't mean best grade. And that's, that's the difference. Um, it's not a best grade method. It's a best fit method. So again, here, the student scored a three, a three and a four. But I know that four was a piece of group work um, where the student, um, where all of the students benefited from that collaborative approach. And I know that, that um, uh, the description for that four, for criterion C, the student is in that box they're in the three to four descriptions that would describe their work but they're not they've not quite perfected consistently what a level four is asking them to do so a three is a more appropriate best fitting description of that that student's um, uh, work for that criterion so I'm going to award them a three sometimes the the, the, the the word best confuses people and students will sometimes say, but my best grade was on that mini project we did at the start. Um, and it's like, it's not best grade, it's best fit, the best descriptor that fits describing your consistent um, uh, achievement at the current time. Um, and again, we have to use professional judgment. So here I've got a two and a five and a five. I'm not going to average that. We The IB does not condone averaging grades. We're not allowed to do that. It's, it's criterion related. So when we give you a number on the report card, that number goes with a description. And it's the description that really tells you what your child can do. It's the description that tells the child what they can do. And they can look at the next level description to see, well, what have I got to do next to improve? Um, it, so we're not averaging grades. So if I look at this and I, and, I, and I look at that, what best fits that child's current work, I could decide it's a five. I don't have to take into account, yes, they did one piece of work that was a two, 
Does a two best describe what they can do? No. And that child is no longer working. I wouldn't say that child's working in a three to four. That child's work is definitely in that criteria a five now. So I'm awarding a five. I'm not bringing it down because of that too. Okay. So as a teacher, we use the Manage Back system to publish our report cards. So we enter the achievement levels onto Manage Back in uh, our grade book called term grades section of our grade book, we enter those grades. What the Manage Back system will do is they will then total those points. They will add, them, it, add it up automatically. That total is then um, automatically referenced against the IB published grade boundaries. Um, and so, um, for each criterion, we score out of eight, but the IB, um, and this is as well for the diploma program, the IB final subject score is always out of seven. So um, this student's got their grades for criterion A, B, C, D. The Manage Back system will total that to 14, and that is automatically referenced against their grade boundaries. So a 14 point score is a three. And so on the report card, you see the final grade and the final grade is a three. For the criteria, I award a three, that matches the descriptor for that criteria. The final grades also have a set of descriptors and we show those on the last page of the report card. So the I, these are IB published descriptors as well. So the student's final grade was a three. What is a three saying about that, the, the student's overall um, achievement? Um, and then we can reference the description at the back. So a three would be a limited achievement against most objectives or showing some clear difficulties in some areas. Okay, so there's a description for all. Okay. So when you read the report card, um, you, would, you will see the total points. So it's at the maximum of 32. So on the um, left-hand side of the screen, you can see this is a sample report card I have created for my fake child on Manage Back, um, Harry Potter. And I have, um, and I'm their science teacher. So you've got the subject, you've got the teacher's name, and then you've got the achievement levels for each criteria. So you can see the total score. Um, he got 25 out of 32, and the system has translated that into the final grade based on the IB published grade boundaries. We cannot change those as a school. We use those as an IB school. Um, what's really important, and of course, it's the last thing that students want to look at. They want to look at the numbers, six out of eight. Um, but the six out of eight is a description of what your child can do. That number, um, and some schools choose not to report the numbers, then the number is just an, a reference point to a description. OK, so um, you will see on the report card um, under knowledge and understanding, it states what your um, child can do. And those are the three strands for science, knowledge and understanding criterion A. And so I can see that my child is outlining. They can um, apply in familiar situations and some unfamiliar situations. They can interpret information to make scientifically supported judgments. OK, um, so their, their, their achievement level there is a six. So although the temptations to go towards um, the number, it is worthwhile picking out there. Is my child explaining? Are they outlining? Are they stating? What, what is this number saying my child can do? There's actually a lot more information in there than, than it first appears. Um, on the last page, so what we've got on screen now is just a snapshot from the last page of the report card. So that has the IB uh, grade boundaries listed and it has the subject final grade descriptors listed as well. Um, so these are the IB published ones. Um, and so 
when you when you're looking at a child's final subject grade you it's worth having a look at that those statements just to get a sense of well where are we on at that scale a lot of parents um uh sort of panic my child got a four my child got a four but actually when you read the description to get a four your child has to produce good quality work to get a four um and that's not that's not a bad description if if we if we didn't say four and we said your child produces good quality work um actually it's not that's not that's not so alarming and i i i um that's what's quite nice about the IB is, is we're not just giving you a number on a scale and you're kind of estimating where your child sits on, on that scale, but you can get a description that kind of describes what kind of work we're looking at. Um, so the IB require for grade 10 students, when we, at the end of grade 10, we can issue um, a Jess, you completed your NYP certificate. If the student has a grade point average of 4.0. So that means taking their final subject grade from each of the eight groups, plus the personal project, which grade 10 have to do, and then dividing that through by the number subjects and looking to see, is there a grade point average of four? And that, that's one of the, that's one of the, the, the things that we look at. So four is a, is a benchmark there for grade 10 in terms of getting that NYP certificate or not. Okay, so the description of a, of a, a grade four is that the student is producing good quality work, um, basic critical creative thinking, knowledge and skills, some flexibility in familiar situations. So um, that familiar situations piece, often when we're, when we're testing criterion A, knowledge and understanding, um, they will get some questions which are very similar to ones they've already seen in class, similar situations, um, and then they will have some unfamiliar questions where they apply their understanding to a new scenario, a new situation, and, and so that's where that's why the, the IB can, can talk about familiar and unfamiliar, which normally comes through criterion A. Um, so I guess what I, I want to say is, is it, it's always worth looking at those descriptors. So um, I wanted to uh, talk about, you know, a lot of parents, how can I help my child improve their grades? Um, so often when we want a student to improve their grade, but often when we're having this conversation with them in class and we're kind of saying, well, what did you get last time? What would you like next time? What's your goal going to be? How are we going to get there? And we might provide exemplars. So we might show them um, uh, an example essay and then say, well, this is an example essay. Look what we've got here in pattern. We take them through the paragraphs. We talk about the vocabulary used. We talk about sentence structure, paragraph structure. So we might look at an exemplar. We might give them a checklist. We might give them a writing scaffold, put this in paragraph. A, put this in paragraph B. We might um, uh, do an example performance. We might show them a video of an example performance, for example, for subjects like drama, subjects like well, any of the arts um, where there's a performance involved. We might be able to show them a video of, a, of, of other students performing so that they can see what we're looking for for, for different grade boundaries. Um, uh, PE for the, for the movement that they might see some previous groups um, doing it. So, so just to just to reiterate, generally to move up an achievement level, we're looking at more sophisticated communication. So students that are very factual in what they express, whether that's 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 an oral examination or a written examination or a piece of a poster or an essay or a presentation. Um, if they're giving very simple sentence structure, very simple language, if they are stating, they're kind of listing and they're very factual, um, that's, that's not as sophisticated communication. If, if they can add an explanation, 
if they can give some examples, if they can justify their choices and, and add more descriptive writing, you're going to see them in, in, increase in, in, in their uh, attainment level. So that's what you're, that's what we're always working towards is trying to improve how the students are expressing their knowledge and understanding. Um, and of course it varies from assessment to assessment and it varies from subject to subject. But when you look at these rubrics, you will always see that, that there's, there's an increased level of, of detail, explanation, justification um, as you work towards those level seven to eight. Um, so what we try and do is we try and support the students um, talking about building up their academic writing skills. And it, is, it can be really quite challenging because for a student, um, sometimes, you know, they'll go, well, I did explain that. And as, a, as you're marking it as an adult and you're coming and saying, well, this is more of an outline. How you could explain is X, Y, Z. So we often give little writing scaffolds or prompts. So, so that was the rubric on the previous slide was an example from the personal project. So here I would, I, I give, I've given them some prompts for that. So um, I've said level one and two, I use research skills too. They would write a very simple statement. So very factual. But if they add in a because, they're adding in more of an outline, more description. So then, then they would be justifying that would bring them up a level. Then if they can talk about consequences, they can connect to the therefore. For. I did this because of this, and therefore this is going to happen. Then they're building up their descriptive writing and they're giving me much more detail so that I can then make that higher judgment of their work. And seven and eight, in this particular example from the personal project, they, if they include examples to justify what, they, um, what they've uh, been discussing in their writing, they will then get that higher grade boundary. So we're looking critical, creative, reflective thinking to get those higher grade boundaries. Um, and this is another example of something we would do with the students. So um, for criterion um, B in the personal project, all of the grade 10 were given these prompt sentences and they were given these um, examples of how you might build up your writing to add more justification, more descriptive language, more interest. I don't expect you to, to read those because that's a... a very, very small font, but just to give you a sense of, it's not just writing more, it's really getting into a bit more of the details, giving more of a flavor, kind of pulling the reader in so they really understand what you've been doing. And so we do give exemplars to students to try and help them with that. Um, so, so number one, I always think is, is kind of to, to to try and support students is to get them to think about, not just look at those numbers, but really getting them thinking about, okay, that's, that's the descriptor that I meet right now. What have I got to do to get to the next box? I need to move from outlining to explaining. And, and, and how do I do that? And that's the conversations we need to be having. So when you have the report card, you get a narrative in semester one, semester two is just great, but semester one, you get that narrative. And the reason that narrative is really important is because we ask teachers to give some strategies to move forward. So you'd get an, um, uh, some information about how your child is in a classroom setting and, and the dynamic of a, of a classroom, particularly during adolescence, has a big influence on, on how a student uh, can sometimes engage with the learning materials. So you'll get a sense of how they are, their approaches to learning, um, how they've got on with their assessment tasks, and then some strategies to move them forward. And that's a really good conversation to have. Um, the students will look at the numbers and it's really good if you at home can bring them back to highlight 
what could they do to move it forward? So that might be um, changing. In this case, I said change the selection of revision tools. So this was just, a uh, again, a fake report card. But um, focusing on those strategies to move forward is, is really important and encouraging them or, or, um, or working with them to connect with that teacher if you need more explicit examples of the strategies going back to that teacher and asking for that um, can be a good way just to su support your child moving forward. I, I've put this, um, I put this slide in here um, under, under assessment because one of the things we face right now um, is, is some interesting situations with technology and assessment. So our students are um, obviously working on their computer and they're preparing work and we work with them to understand you, you can't just cut and paste from a source into your work because it's not then your work. So paraphrasing, that's another skill that, that we develop. And it, that's a hard skill when you're, when you're grade six and you're 11 and, and you've got this, this new device and you've been asked to find out about the rainforest and that's great and that's great and you're pulling all this information from different sites. So we work with them on paraphrasing. We, we work with them on examples of, of you know, using quotation marks, putting in your in-text references and that idea of academic honesty. These words aren't mine. Um, so how can I use these words? How can I use this information I've gathered? But there are a few more things that have come into assessment recently that we have to be mindful of as teachers from our side. And uh, first of all, the lovely smartwatch, which is fantastic, but not when a child walks into an exam room because they can literally, um, some of these watches can photograph and they can share messages and they can share things. So we do ask during exam periods for students to put smartwatches away. I really do encourage students to wear watches during assessment periods because I think they should be able to monitor their time um, and that helps them keep their pace. Um, uh, but smart watches, we always have to, to be mindful of. The other thing um, that you can see in their little example video that's going on um, on the screen are these amazing tools now, and there's a variety. Uh, there's one called Ginger, which does 40 languages. There's Grammarly, Quillbot, Language Tool, Paper Rater, um, and Hemingway. And what these apps will do, as you, you're seeing on the screen, is they basically allow students, and I've watched students do this, and it's, it's really fascinating. A student can take a paragraph of work and, and, and roll it through. Um, and click, 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 and I've suddenly got a page of very sophisticated writing. But that student can't tell me what some of those words mean. They can't tell me what the sentence means. It's not their language, but there's this, ama this amazing tools that are available now. So sometimes, and I know, I know this can be frustrating, your, your child sat down, they're working on their computer, and we come back and we go, not really sure this is your own work. And it's not that it's copied and pasted, but we know it's just not the words and vocabulary they use. And that's because there's these amazing tools and they can just click, 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 click and rewrite, reword their, their work. It's really important that these are great tools, but the students need to um, understand what they're submitting and they need to understand what they're doing so we're working with students on assessment tasks and we're talking about things like this and it's something we all have to be aware of um, and I love the quote I, I pulled out the quote at the bottom helpful professor says Grammarly is uh, never cheating and um, uh, you'll see better grades using it yes but if you end up handing in a piece of work and you don't understand half the words you've written um, your teacher's going to pick up on that. And that isn't helping you. Um, it's actually holding you back from developing that vocabulary naturally. So we do work with students on this as well. And I know that was a question from, from a couple of parents. Okay. 
So it is a partnership with assessment. And I hope, I hope we've given you a taste of what we do. We really, um, you know, it really helps in the NYP, having taught it for, for a lot of years, that, that you, um, you know, you keep, keep an awareness. I know that's hard with adolescents, but you keep an awareness of your child's assessment calendar. Um, you, you get them talking about the descriptions. You engage with them in conversations about their report card and, and what the teacher suggested as strategies. Um, moving forwards but I know sometimes that's a hard balance because as they get into those peak adolescent years they do want to forge their independence which is perfectly natural um, uh, from our side um, uh, the students get their task notifications they get their rubrics we ask teachers for a two-week um, notification prior to an assessment task um, we take uh, the, the maximum turnaround is three weeks and then it should be published on our grade books. Uh, we have to use the IB mandated criteria indicating grading on a rubric can be available and we share assessment data in our manage back system. So we have the grade book. There's a new feature on grade book this year and we're just coming to grips with it and it's a little eye icon and if we don't click it you don't see the assessment data. Um, and that's new this year. And it's a lovely feature, it means we can populate it before we release it, but we have, to, we have to remember now that's new, that we've got to click on that I so you can see our data and the students can see our data. So I know I've worked with a couple of families that haven't never seen data and we've realized we just haven't clicked that I. Um, so the landing page would look uh, like this. You, um, when you come in to manage back, you've got a list of your child's classes. You now have to click on the class. That's a little bit frustrating, I realise. You have to pick on, click on the subject, and then at the top, you've got a list of the units for that subject. And then you've got, uh, you should have a bar chart, which shows the assessment, and then the completed tasks. And you need to just, in the top right-hand corner, it's the period of the academic year. And you just need, to, so if you want to look at last semesters, you need to click on last semester's dates. And this semester, you need to be on this semester's dates. Um, it doesn't all appear at once, unfortunately. So that's just a feature of the system. Um, and I just want to say, you also see lessons there. Those are um, a new feature, online lessons that we can teach via Manage Back, which we don't use because we tend to use Teams if we have to teach online. So your teachers of your student will have their gradebook on manage back that holds our assessment student assessment data. That's where we retain it. It's confidential to you as long as you keep your login confidential. And if you have any problems with that, that's the school system that I look after. Um, so you just contact me if you're having problems with your login or you need a new login. Uh, you want me to reissue that. Um, and uh, I've, I've already run one session on logging into Manage Back um, this year, and we have a video recording of that. So if anybody needs it, I'm quite happy to share that one again. And some parents I've just done a, a quick Zoom with and we've, we've worked it through together. Um, so you've got the bar chart that you can see for visual and then for the criteria, you'd see seven out of eight. Um, and then if you click on the eye, it will give you some information. And if you click on the speech bubble, it will you'll see whatever the teacher wrote. So this was just a, a quick, quick um, example one. Um, for report cards on Manage Back, they are stored on Manage Back. So if you click on the little icon that looks like two sheets of paper from the, the, the dark panel on the left hand side, um, that will take you to term reports and then that's where you will find your semester report cards. Please download them. You own them. Um, as the parents, so please download them and save them to wherever you save your documents because you may need them. Some tertiary education places like to see a child's report cards as evidence of ongoing education K to 12. And so it's always good that you retain those. Um, um, for yourselves so that you have a record so that your child always has a record of those report cards if you don't ever need them that's okay 
but better to have them rather than not. Um, the, the other thing, um, uh, so I would say is um, when we archive someone's account, when they leave Manage Back, we usually give a period of a month or so after the time of leaving before we fully archive that student. So you've got time to retrieve those report cards. But I always think it's important to take ownership of those. Um, now, and the other thing I want to just mention is we do use official names on report cards because they are considered a legal document. And so it doesn't mean your the teachers don't know your child likes to be called Katie. Um, they do, but we ask that they use the official name because this is an official document. And we should be using the name that your child is registered under. Okay, so. I know lots of information. I know I've gone over time. So just very quickly, there's lots of different assessment types. We do posters and performances and, and physical activities and uh, present um, oral presentations and essays and leaflets and model building and all sorts of different things. Of course, as we get towards nine and 10, you will see more exams come into play because practicing that skill of longer term knowledge retention and demonstration is really important. Um, so we have the published rubrics, um, which you can see the published rubrics through Manage Back. When you click on the task, you click the I for information, it will have those published strands. Um, and we use best fit approach, which again is mandated by the IB. Um, I wanted to go to any questions. I can see we've got one question in the um, uh, Q&A box, but I wanted to say, if you have a specific question related to your child, um, I wouldn't, I'd prefer you to contact me and we, we do, we respect your child's confidentiality and we, we, we talk about that. So if you've got a question about why did little Fred get a, a, a four for Criterion A Science, um, uh, probably not the forum to talk about it because we don't, everybody's online and in their own homes and there are other children probably in the background and, and I think it's just better to, 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 to deal with rather than mentioning individual children's names. So please drop me a line. I'm really happy to talk with parents and, and meet parents and, and meet with parents and students and, and have that conversation about the NYP because I'm very passionate about it. And I, and I think it's really important that you have a good understanding because you've selected it as a system for your, for your child. Okay. Um, how often is score eight out of eight is awarded if ever? Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, so the question about how often is score eight out of eight awarded? Um, Sometimes quite frequently, um, uh, and, and some, some students get eight out of eight quite consistently. Um, the, the global grade point average, um, the, so the, the grade point average for NYP is around 4.2. Uh, we as a school are 5.4. Um, our students, our students um, are doing very, very well. Um, what is the point of the score eight out of the criteria? The reason that needs to be an even set of numbers is there's, there's four basic levels, right? There's four sets of descriptions. Um, so that's why you get your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's four sets of descriptions, so four levels of sophistication. Most, it's very, very, very rare to ever see a one. In my experience of working in the NYP here, um, uh, very rare for students to drop below that grade point average of a four. So um, the reason you, you need for each of those descriptors, there's, there's the higher and the lower achievement level. So there's the seven or the eight. So, when you take the higher one from each set of descriptors. So if I take eight, if I award an eight, it means the student is consistently showing work that matches that description. 
If it's a seven, it means the student has demonstrated work, some work with that match aligns with that description, but they're either not consistently doing it or there are, there's still room there for improvement. So the reason it goes, that's sort of an even set of numbers is so as a teacher, you can say, they're partially meeting this description or they're completely meeting this description. If it only went up to seven, you couldn't, it doesn't allow you to, dis to distinguish between a child that partially meets that description or completely meets that description. So that's why those, those criterion are out of eight. The IB have, um, uh, have got this fixed seven point scale for the overall subject grade. Um, uh, and they use that again, again with the diploma, which does tend towards that bell curve norm distribution. Um, so yeah, I know it's I know it's frustrating for me. Long term MYP, they used to have different um, different criteria for different subjects were marked out of different amounts. So some were marked out of six, and some were marked out of eight, and some were marked out of ten. So it's certainly a lot more consistent and easier to understand but you'd always need an even amount of numbers um, for the four levels of descriptor. So that's, that's why it's out of eight. Um, can we get access or see the questions and answers of summative tests? Um, yes, sometimes. Um, what tends to happen with summative tests, particularly grade nine and 10, where these are, these are long exam papers, um, is that the students go through them in class with the teacher. So the student sees their response and they see what the, the teacher has graded it, but it doesn't get taken home. Um, but in the lead up to the exam, they would have done similar questions in class and they would be bringing those home. So you can see the style of question and you can see your child's style of answer, what kind of response they're giving, how much detail they're giving through that. Also, some many of the textbooks would have exemplar questions and exemplar responses. So you get, the students get a sense of what, what, what's in the exam paper before that. So we often run formative tests so the students get the sense of, well, what would a test question look like? Or we use old test questions for homework or in, in class. So the students get that practice, that rehearsal of doing test questions and responding to them and finding out where they would achieve. The difference is, and having come from an, you know, an IGCC background, an IGCC test for science, um, I sit down with it, there's a right or wrong answer to every question on the mark scheme, and I'm ticking the student's work, and um, I'm giving them a score out of 100, a percentage. And it's really quick to mark, and those questions are generated by an external body. With the MYP, we have to generate our own questions. So if you a topic is eight weeks, and I've got to generate unfamiliar questions, I want to be able to use that question again. I want to be able to use that question for the next three years. That was a hard question to develop and I developed that as a teacher. And so we, we, we go through it with the students at class, but it doesn't go home, you know, a sibling or they, 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 they might show it to the next grade level and then it wouldn't be a fair, it wouldn't be fair to assess using that question again. Um, when they're younger, they will sometimes they will sometimes come home. So it it, it does it does depend, um, uh, and I think I think that that door's always open to make those appointments. I know it's been hard with COVID, but make those appointments with the teacher to sit down and look at your child's paper with that teacher through the parent teacher conferences, through the um, uh, uh, we have we have the side we put the time we put aside now where you can reserve time slots with us. So, um, but the students do go through it in, in class in some detail. Um, last year, the report card showed effort grades. Those are dropped in grade 10. Those, um, those are, we have removed from our report cards across the grade levels. Um, those were approaches to learning grades. Um, the IB, um, 
approaches to learning is actually, it's a little bit more complex than, than just awarding a, a, a student an effort grade. And we felt that we were not giving, um, you know, it was, a, it was a tick box exercise, if you like. But most children making the effort, making the effort, making the effort. And actually not every subject would be at, uh, addressing every ATL. There are 122 separate ATL strands and not every subject is meant to do all of them. Some subjects take some, other subjects take others. So when we were giving those ATL scores, um, we felt that that wasn't meaningful data. So we're now asking the teachers to make sure that they include that information in their narrative. So if they feel there's a gap with an ATL skill and approaches to learning skill, they should include that within the narrative. Um, so it's not that we've dropped them for grade 10, but we've, 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 we've dropped them across the board, including in our DP reports. Um, uh, we still see teachers not posting grades and management for summer to test. Is this okay? I think it's probably Tom, that icon button, um, which is new this year. And, and it's a case of clicking it on the side. So where a parent says to me, um, or says to a teacher, I can't see your grade book. Teachers normally write to me straight away saying they can't see my grade book. And I say, you've got to click the little I button that appeared. Manage Back does a lot of updates throughout the year. And we have to kind of chase those updates. That's one of the problems with that system. Um, so if you see that you're not getting a grade within three weeks of that summative assessment, um, no, it's not okay that you're not seeing it but it might just be that a button needs clicking to unlock the grade book. And you need to, you know, let me know if that, where that's the case and we'll follow that up for you. Absolutely. We, 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 we use the Manage Back system. And we, I, I, was, I was the one that brought us onto the Manage Back system many moons ago in a different role. Um, so we could share um, assessment data with you and so that you could click on a unit and see what are we teaching in that unit? What's the essence of what we're trying to teach your child? So um, uh, there, there's something, something's going on there if you're not seeing the grades. And so if you um, let me know which subjects, drop me a line or, or drop a teach, the teacher a line if you feel better to contact them directly, that's fine. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll get that fixed. Are there any other questions? Does anyone want to? add anything or ask for any clarifications. I'm conscious I'm going longer into your evening. So I'm going to assume that's a no. And thank you. Um, okay, we've got a couple more. Um, are the guidelines to how many summative tests a student can have in a week and how many in a day? Um, we do monitor it to keep to two summatives maximum a day um, and we do monitor it overall. Um, I monitor it overall. Um, the thing, uh, we had a couple of issues with grades six and seven because of the vaccination status, they were put onto home-based learning and that had a real knock-on effect for them because um, we can't do the summative assessment, they're not, they're not here. They couldn't do the performance or do the oral, or present to their teacher or effectively or take the exam um, when they were away. And that meant when they came back, um, teachers had thought, you know, being kind, we're not gonna force them to do this while they're at home. It's not their fault, it's COVID regulations. They came back and they had a, had, had a bulk. And I, I did spend a bit of time in homeroom times talking to the grade six and they, but, but they assured me, oh, no, this is done. And, and actually, we got that done early and that one's been postponed and that one we've got next week. So you do sometimes get these these anomalies where things things aren't aren't quite right. And, um, and I think I, I certainly noticed it around that period. And that's 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 far from from suitable. One of those problems being 
semester one being so short and that extra week at the end of the holiday meant nothing could be assessed in January because the report cards were already had to be written by the teachers. So it bunched things up a little bit. And we're looking at how we can rearrange that for next year. So I do monitor and, and address it and, and talk with the students where I see it and when parents address it. And that's, that's been um, something that, that we need to, to always do, I think. But a rule of thumb is no more than two summatives in a day. Bear in mind, some summatives are handing in. So for example, science essay, the students might, I, I might have given them five lessons to write a five paragraph essay. And lesson one, scaffold it, I put an exemplar on the board, they write paragraph one. Lesson two, they write paragraph two and so on and so forth. And on that last day, all they're doing is uploading it to manage back during my lesson time. So that st the, the stress of that, that workload has actually been spread and incredibly scaffolded. Um, whereas a test, that, that brings, it's, that brings that, that you, your revisions to the before and you've got that stress on the day. So um, I also look at the type of assessment going on. I know design, they have a workbook, they respond to questions in the workbook, they respond to questions each and every lesson as they go through. They do a little bit every lesson. And that summative assessment day, they hand that workbook in, or for the older grades, they upload that workbook. And um, but they've been putting work into throughout. Of course, there are the odd student who will leave everything to the last minute and not use that lesson time for what it was supposed to be used for. And we work with those students to, 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 to manage their time better. Um, um, and, and, uh, but we know that's an upload date. So two summatives a day, but we also want to, we want to make sure we've got that balance of types. You don't, want, you don't want really two tests in a day affecting the whole homeroom. That, that's quite a lot. So I, I, I'm always in the background there monitoring it. We, and generally, in my experience, there's less squashing in semester two because it's a little bit longer. So that's something I want to look into for next next year. What do we do with that shorter semester one um, in terms of squashing? And let's hope no more no more students not allowed in because of them having uh, vaccination status or lockdown or mandatory staying at home. Fingers crossed. Okay, I think that's it for the, the um, uh, questions. The, the question about not returning the, the test paper. Um, yeah, it's for the reasons I mentioned before. We don't return the test papers um, in the, the nine and 10 for certain subjects because um, we create those test papers to be used year after year after year after year. And if they went home, um, they could go to a sibling, they could go, um, they could be uploaded online and published to the next grade level. And that would um, make that assessment invalid, essentially. Um, test paper takes a, a long time. An NYP test paper takes a long time to develop because it can't be based on a point score. Um, you can't, you can't mark it out of 100 or mark it out of 30 um, as a teacher. So, so um, you're not looking at this, this question's worth two marks. The, the student has to develop a descriptive answer. So um, there's no simplistic mark scheme to an NYP marking paper. It takes a lot longer than marking a, a point-based system exam paper. Um, so when we develop a good exam paper for a unit that we're going to use year after year, then we want to assess that unit with that exam paper year after year after year, which is why we have to do sample exam papers and sample formatives and send those home. Um, and that's why we do the reviewing with the students in class and we're trying to encourage them to then set goals.
Okay. I'm going to wish you all a lovely evening. I will send out the recording. Um, and thank you, thank you for your time and thank you for your questions. And please do um, contact me or Sarah if you have, you know, if you feel you need a, more of a discussion, there's something you want to highlight. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Have a lovely evening, everyone. And, and thank you. <laughs>